What up, everybody? This is your boy Tech G back with another video to help you successfully pass the CompTIA Network Plus N10 007 certification. So let's get into it. In this video, you're going to learn about IP version 6 addressing and network performance concepts such as NAT, PAT, port forwarding, access control lists, distributed switching, packet switch versus circuit switch networks, and software defined networks. First things first, let's talk about IP version six. So internet protocol version six, this is the most recent version of the internet protocol or the communications protocol that provides an identification and location system for computers on networks and it routes traffic across the internet. IP version six uses 128 bit source and destination IP addresses as compared to 32 bit for IP version four. And this theoretically enables you to have up to 340 undecillion addresses are 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power. IP version 6 also features built-in security and provides better support for quality of service routing, which is important to achieve high quality streaming audio and video traffic. And Windows, Mac, and Linux, they all support IP version 6. So IP version 6 addresses, like I stated earlier, they are 128-bit addresses that are each divided into eight 16-bit blocks. The blocks are converted into hexadecimal and each block is separated from the following block by a colon and leading zeros. They are typically suppressed, but each block must contain at least one digit. And let's talk about the rules for abbreviating an IP version six address. So the first thing is leading zeros in a field can be omitted and then contingent fields containing all zeros can be represented with a double colon. And this can only be done once for a single IP version six address. So here's an example. You have the IP version six address of ABCD 01234040, so on and so forth. Its abbreviated version will look like the following ABCD colon 123 colon 4040 double colon A colon B. So those colons basically represents all of the zeros being taken out. And then if the certain block leads with the number zero, you can leave off the zero as in the case of the 123. Let's talk about IP version six address types. So IP version six, it supports three types of addresses. You have unicast, multicast, and anycast. And unicast, this is any address that identifies a unique node on a network. Unicast addressing is available in IP version four and IP version six, and typically refers to a single sender or single receiver, although it can be used for both sending and receiving. Unicast is the most common form of IP addressing. In IP version six, globally routable unicast addresses, they start with the first four hexadecimal characters in the range of 2000 to 3999. Next, we have multicast, and this is a specific type of IP address labeling a network location that is used to multicast data packets within a network. It stands in contrast to other IP addresses that only allow for unicast models. Both IP version four and IP version six, they support multicasting, and multicast enables the distribution of content such as the internet, TV, and other types of streaming media, and multicast addresses, they begin with FF as the first two hexadecimal characters. And then we have Anycast, and this is a network addressing and routing methodology in which a single destination address has multiple routing paths to two or more endpoint destinations. This is also known as one-to-one -to, -one to many association, and Anycast can be used for distributed services such as DNS or other situations in which automatic failover is desirable, and IP version 6 uses Anycast cast addresses as destination addresses that are assigned only to routers and any cast addresses they are assigned from the unicast address space. And here are some other unique aspects about IP version six addressing. So in IP version six link local address, this is also used on each IP version six interface and the link local address that begins with FE80. And then IP version six can also use auto configuration to discover the current network and select the host ID that is unique to that network. Automatic generation of a unique host ID. This is made possible through a process known as EUI 64, which uses the 48-bit MAC address on the device to aid in the generation of the unique 64-bit host ID. And then IP version 6 can also use a special version of DHCP for IP version 6, which is referred to as D64. 
DHCP version six. And then the protocol that is used to discover the network address and learn the layer two address of neighbors on the same network is called neighbor discovery protocol. Next is IP version six tunneling. So IP version six tunneling, this is a mechanism for encapsulating IP version four and IP version six packets within a site to site IP version six VPN. It is used to form a virtual point to point link between IP version six nodes and IP version six tunnels are stateless and they have no knowledge of the configuration or existence of the remote tunnel endpoint. Once an IP version six tunnel is configured, packets are encapsulated and forwarded regardless of whether the decapsulating device is present or not. And IP version six tunneling allows hosts in one private IP network to communicate with hosts in another private IP network by providing a tunnel between two routers across the internet. And the IP version six tunnel connection endpoints are terminated via a virtual tunnel interface or a VTI that is configured in each device. Next, we have IP version six dual stack. So dual stack means that devices are able to run IP version four and IP version six in parallel. It allows hosts to simultaneously reach IP version four and IP version six content. So it offers a very flexible coexistence strategy. With dual stack, every networking device, server, switch, router, and firewall in an ISP's network will be configured with both IP version four and IP version six connectivity capabilities. And some of the benefits of the IP version six dual stack are as follows. You have native dual stack. It does not require any tunneling mechanisms on internal networks, both IP version four and IP version six, they run independent of each other. And then dual stack supports gradual migration of endpoints, networks, and applications. Next, let's talk about router advertisement. So routers, they advertise their presence together with various link and internet parameters, either periodically or in response to a router solicitation message. And the host will then use the information to learn the prefixes and parameters for the local network. Next, we have neighbor discovery. So neighbor discovery, this is a protocol that allows different nodes on the same link to advertise their existence to their neighbors and to learn about the existence of their neighbors. And routers and hosts are nodes. They use neighbor discovery messages to determine the link layer addresses of neighbors that reside on attached links and to overwrite invalid cache entries. Hosts also use neighbor discovery to find neighboring routers that can forward packets on their behalf. In addition, nodes use neighbor discovery to actively track the ability to reach neighbors. And when a router or the path to a router fails, nodes actively search for alternatives to reach that destination. All right, next we're gonna talk about performance concepts. And the first concept we're gonna talk about is called traffic shaping. So traffic shaping, this is a bandwidth management technique used on computer networks, which delays some or all datagrams to bring them into compliance with a desired traffic profile. Traffic shaping is used to optimize or guarantee performance, improve latency, or increase usable bandwidth for some kinds of packets by delaying other kinds. It is often confused with traffic policing, which is the distinct but related practice of packet dropping and packet marking. The most common type of traffic shaping is called application-based traffic shaping. In application-based traffic shaping, fingerprinting tools are first used to identify the application associated with a data packet. And based on this, specific traffic shaping policies are then applied. So for example, you might want to use application-based traffic shaping to throttle peer-to-peer -peer file sharing while giving maximum bandwidth to a business critical application such as voice over IP, which is especially sensitive to latency. The next performance concept is called quality of service. So quality of service, this is the description or measurement of the overall performance of a service, such as telephony or computer network or cloud computing service, particularly the performance seen by the users on the network. So quality of service is very important when it comes to streaming media, gaming, or voice over IP services. Quality of service prioritizes real-time and streaming traffic, and depending on the router, QoS can 
can simply be turned on and off, or it can be tweaked by specifying services to prioritize, whether to optimize for gaming and uplink downlink speeds to use. QoS can also be configured by an ISP, and if an ISP is performing QoS optimization, the changes you make on your router, well, they simply will not improve your traffic. The next performance concept is called diff serve or differentiated services. So differentiated services, this is a computer networking architecture that specifies a simple and scalable mechanism for classifying and managing network traffic and providing quality of service on modern IP networks. Differentiated services can be used to provide low latency to critical network traffic such as voice or streaming media while providing simple best effort service to non-critical services such as web traffic or file transfers. And the next performance concept that we're going to learn about is called class of service. So when a network experiences congestion and delay, some packets must be prioritized to avoid random loss of data. Class of service accomplishes this prioritization by dividing similar types of traffic such as email, streaming video, voice, large document file transfers into classes. Different levels of priority are then applied for throughput and packet loss to each group to control traffic behavior. All right, now let's talk about network address translation. So network address translation, this is a method of remapping an IP address space into another by modifying network address information in the IP header of packets while they are in transit across a traffic routing device. So in layman's terms, NAT is the process where a network device, usually a firewall, assigns a public address to a computer or group of computers inside a private network. The main use of NAT is to limit or hide an entire IP IP address space on a LAN for both economic and security purposes. This functionality is typically built into a router, so when NAT is implemented before an IP address on the LAN can communicate with the internet, the IP address has to be converted to the public IP address of the router. This allows for the router to appear as if it is the only device making a connection to remote computers on the internet, which provides safety for computers on the LAN. It also allows a single IP address to do the work for many IP addresses in the LAN and that is performed automatically on Soho routers when connected to an IP version 4 network and that is not necessary on an IP version 6 network because IP version 6 is much more secure and has no shortage of IP addresses. Next we have port address translation or PAT. So port address translation this is a function that allows multiple users within a private network to make use of a minimal number of IP addresses. Its basic function is to share single IP public addresses between multiple clients who need to use the internet publicly. It is an extension of the network address translation and an example of PAT is a home network that is connected to the internet. Within this setup, the system's router is assigned a discrete IP address and then multiple users can access the internet over the router and are each assigned a port number as they do so. Next concept we're going to talk about is port forwarding. So in computer networking, port forwarding which is also known as DNAT or Destination Network Address Translation. This is an application of NAT that redirects a communication request from one address and port number combination to another while the packets are traversing a network gateway, such as a router or a firewall. So in layman's terms, port forwarding allows remote computers to connect to a specific computer or service within a private local area network. An example could be an FTP server residing inside of a LAN that has the IP address of 192, 168, 1.240 with port 21 open to allow for external computers to connect to engage in file transactions. In order for the external computers to connect, these devices would need to know the IP address of your router. So let's just imagine that your IP address is 68.54.121.93. And then they would also need to know the appropriate port number or port 21. And once the external computer is granted access to the LAN, the external device is packed Packets will then be forwarded to the FTP server at 192.168.1.240 port 21. Next, we're going to talk about an ACL or an access control list. So an access control list, this is a set of rules that is usually used to filter network traffic. ACLs can be configured on network devices with packet filtering capabilities, such as routers and firewalls. And ACLs, they contain a list of conditions that categorize packets and help you to determine when to allow or deny network traffic. And they are applied on the interface basis to packets leaving or entering an interface. 
Next is distributed switching. So distributed switching, this is an architecture in which multiple processor control switching units are distributed. There is often a hierarchy of switching elements with a centralized host switch and with remote switches located close to a concentration of users. Distributed switching is often used in telephone networks where it is often referred to as host remote switching. So in rural areas, population centers tend to be small for economical development of full feature dedicated telephone exchanges and distances between these centers make transmission costs relatively expensive. So normal telephone traffic patterns show that most calling is done between people in these population centers and the use of distributed switching would allow for the majority of these calls that are local to that population center to be switched there without needing to be transported to and from the host switch. The host switch provides connectivity between the remote switches and to the larger network and the host may also directly handle some rare and complex call types such as conference calling that the remote itself is not equipped to handle. Next, we have a packet switch network. So packet switching, this is a method of grouping data that is transmitted over a digital network into packets. And packets are made of a header and a payload and data in the header is used by networking hardware to direct the packet to its destination where the payload is extracted and used by application software. And packet switching, this is the primary basis for data communications in computer networks around the world. Then we have circuit switch networking. So circuit switch switching, this is a method of implementing a telecommunications network in which two network nodes establish a dedicated communications channel, also known as a circuit, through the network before the nodes may communicate. The circuit guarantees the full bandwidth of the channel and remains connected for the duration of the communication session. The circuit functions as if the nodes were physically connected as with an electrical circuit. Circuit switching originated in analog telephone networks where the network created a dedicated circuit between two telephones for the duration of a telephone call. It contrasts with packet switching used in modern digital networks in which the trunk lines between switching centers carry data between many different nodes in the form of data packets without dedicated circuits. And then we have software defined networking. So software defined networking technology. This is an approach to network management that enables dynamic, programmatically efficient network configuration in order to improve network performance and monitoring thereby making it more like cloud computing than traditional network management. And SDN is meant to address the fact that the static architecture of traditional networks is decentralized and complex, while current networks require more flexibility and easy troubleshooting. And SDN attempts to centralize network intelligence in one network component by disassociating the forwarding process of network packets from the routing process. The routing process consists of one or more controllers, which are considered the brain of the SDN network where the whole intelligence is incorporated. However, the intelligent centralization has its own drawbacks when it comes to security, scalability, and elasticity. And this is the main issue associated with software defined networks. All right, so that is my quick little class. So let's go ahead and do some of this outstanding check on learning, shall we? So the first question is, which of the following IP version six protocols is used by network nodes for locating routers? Is it NDP, NTP, NDR, or NCP? So which of the following IP version six protocols is used by network nodes for locating routers? And the correct answer is, this would be the neighbor discovery protocol. Next question. A rule-based access control mechanism implemented on routers, switches, and firewalls. This is known as what? Is this an ACL, a CSR, a DLP, or an AUP? So a rule-based access control mechanism implemented on these networking devices is known as what? The correct answer is this would be an access control list or an ACL. All right, so in summary, we have talked about IP version six addressing and networking performance concepts such as NAT, PAT, port forwarding, ACLs, distributed switching, packet switching versus circuit switching and software defined networking and a whole bunch of other stuff in between. Now, if you felt like you've gotten something valuable out of this information, go ahead and hit the like button, share button, drop a comment, but most importantly, subscribe to this channel. Also go check out my website, 
website, Technology G, so that you can get read up on the latest and greatest to help you successfully pass the CompTIA Network Plus N10-007 certification. And until next video, ladies and gentlemen, peace.